In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. This year we can't all cry out those words together in a full church, but it is nonetheless true, and it's a proclamation that's even more meaningful right now. Death is conquered, Christ is risen. I watched a webinar a week or two ago in which one of the guests was Dr. Lydia Dugdale, a physician at Columbia University who specializes in treatment of the aged and in medical ethics. She has a book coming out called The Lost Art of Dying Well, which responds to the fact that unlike countless previous generations, we Westerners whose lifespans have happened to fall in the past century or so have been uniquely able to skirt the topic of death and especially to avoid talking about the fact that we ourselves are going to die. We've forgotten how to receive mortality as an, an opportunity to ask big questions. We've forgotten how to prepare intentionally for death. And we need to relearn this because mortality has once again taken center stage along with its colleagues, powerlessness, anger, and fear. Over 12,000 people have died of COVID-19 in the USA so far. There aren't enough beds. There aren't enough equipment pieces. We don't know what will happen to our businesses, to our retirement savings, to our plans for 2021, to our vulnerable family members. We don't even know if the disease should claim someone we love, if we'll be able to go to the funeral. And as Dugdale says, contemporary people like us are not used to thinking about these kinds of things. We don't easily ask, am I ready to die? Am I spending my life? in a way that really matters. But now the times force us to ask such difficult questions. There are people who treat our Christian proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus, of, of Easter, as a sort of analgesic, as something designed to dull the pain of questions like that comforting story that helps us feel better and keeps us distracted from our suffering. Some of us may even have had people try and use it that way on us, try to rush us out of, say, our crushing grief at the loss of somebody especially dear, saying, don't feel sad, he's in a better place. You should be happy for him. If we have anything to say, and this year especially, on Easter Sunday, it had better not sound at all like that. It had better start with the truth that Jesus suffered and died in agony, like the people in ICUs all over the world. He gasped for breath on the cross as his lungs filled with fluid. Like the people confined now and quarantined, he faced his torment without his friends and colleagues, and in his final hour without even the felt presence of God, whom he said had also forsaken him. He was crushed by public shame. He descended into hell. This is what happened to God in Christ. We can't skip over that. We shouldn't ever, but especially not this year, because we need that truth now. We need to know, not just that ever since then, God is with us, completely with us in sickness and isolation and powerlessness and the approach of death. 
Yes, we need to know that God accompanies us there, that he understands completely our experience of isolation and powerlessness and fear, but we also need to know something else. We need to understand that all of that is what Jesus was raised from, raised through, raised against, raised to conquer. In his resurrection, Jesus does not suddenly waltz on stage like some bespangled assistant that we just saw a stage magician cut into three pieces. Delightfully whole and cheery at the end of what only seemed to be an ordeal, waving, accepting applause and saying, see, I'm fine after all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. No, it's not like that. Jesus appears carrying everything he has been through, the wounds to prove it still gaping open. He appears bearing in his now risen and glorified body the entire incalculable weight of sin and death, soaked through with every drop of human fear and despair and hopelessness throughout the ages, his pierced heart full to overflowing with every wailing widow, every abandoned or abused child, every steadily mounting fever, every flatlined heart monitor, every gasp for breath that has ever been. In his risen flesh, he is carrying it, carrying it all, yet radiant. By his death and resurrection, Jesus has acknowledged and taken into himself and metabolized every atom of evil that has ever corrupted and destroyed the creatures of earth and returned it as good. Every atom of death that has ever broken a human heart and returned it as life. Not just more of this life, not just a few extra years to string out the distractions and the stresses that we all used to take so seriously before COVID-19. Not that kind of life, but everlasting life, God's own life, a life that is immune to evil. That life starts the moment Easter starts, the moment the tomb is empty, the moment Jesus' lifeless and destroyed body becomes his risen body. The life of Easter has not downplayed, not avoided, but faced and conquered evil, and it invades our world on Easter morning. It comes determined, having raised Jesus Christ, to raise everyone and everything else along with him, and it cannot be stopped. Now hear me right, the risen life that Jesus has won for you this Easter morning will not keep you from having to pass through death or from potentially losing your retirement savings or from being hospitalized with COVID-19. God does not promise such things, but he does promise that none of that, when you face it anchored in the life of the risen Christ, none of that can conquer you. None of that can kill you. None of that can ruin you because Jesus Christ has already conquered killed and ruined death and you belong to him this easter morning and forever <laughs>